when you step out of your comfort zone and just kind of go through uh, what that door of opportunity is with curious exploration, it takes you further than you could ever believe. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be together again and excited to spend some time with Shay Sparks, who I know a lot of folks on here know or are familiar with. She's no secret around Kansas City with all of the uh, great things she's been involved in. And uh, Shay and I've had great conversations before just about her journey and and things she's learned along the way and the work she's involved in now. So so Shay, I'm going to hand it off to you and let you tell everybody a little bit about this. Uh, it's it's not a straight line journey. You kind of meander around from thing to thing and conversation to conversation and get inspired along the way and take on new things. And it's it's a real life journey. And that's what's really cool about it. So why don't you uh, tell everybody a little bit about what you've been doing? Oh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Randy. I'm completely honored to be here today. And it is Thursday, so it's Thankful Thursday. So think about uh, one thing that you could be thankful for today. And that's kind of where my journey started, actually. About 13 years ago, I was getting out of an abusive relationship. And have you ever found yourself just completely depressed, devastated, don't know when you even know where to go next? That was where I was. And I started to think about one question that really led me to kind of where I am today of what is it that I don't know that I need to know in order to move forward? So statistically, um, abused women or domestic violence victims, I'll say that, go back to either the, the same person or go back to someone that's similar. And so I knew that I, had uh, to do something different. And yet I didn't know what that was. So I read books, I went to counseling, I hired coaches. And over the years, like Randy said, it's been just an amazing journey of one door opening the next door, one conversation leading to the next conversation. And since then I have changed careers. I um, started out as a hairstylist for um, many years and now I'm a certified fearless living coach, trainer, speaker, author, and I have a podcast. And <laughs> the funny thing is, is that none of that would have happened had I not gotten out of that relationship. And I knew that when that happened, I had a second chance. I had a ch second chance to do something different with my life and to be able to give back. And, the, and what was so interesting about that is I didn't even realize until then that for the first 34 years of my life, I was just waiting to die. And when I say that, I wasn't thinking about suicide. It was just, I never thought there was anything else better. Like I was just kind of stuck in a rut. Like this is it, this is all there is. And so I just started to really step out of my comfort zone and try new things, which is how I got here, right? And isn't that how we all get here? We kind of step out of our comfort zone and see what's around the corner. And yet some people get stopped and they don't step out of their comfort zone. They don't know how to move forward. They don't even maybe realize the thoughts that they're thinking are so automatic that it's stopping them. And that's really what I had figured out in the very beginning is that I had this inner negative voice that was just really holding me down. And it wasn't allowing me to, to create a life that I wanted. It wasn't allowing me to, to dream bigger than what I was already in. So for instance, if you have a, a, a cup, right? Anybody drinking coffee or tea this morning? So yeah, thank you for showing me. So when you're in that kind of inner negative voice, all you know is what's inside of that cup. You don't know that there's a whole lot of other things around it. 
on it, outside of it. You have no idea. So for some people, you drive five miles to work or, you know, back when we drove to work, you would drive the same five miles, the same route. And you had no idea that there were other things until maybe traffic happened and you had to take a different route, right? So that's kind of where I was. I was just stuck inside this cup, not realizing there was a whole nother world out there. And through the books that I read, when you are, when one of the books I read was called uh, Women Who Love Too Much. And one of the characteristics was you are in a relationship that's very familiar to how your parents raised you. And I don't blame my parents for anything. What I found is that they didn't really have the skills and the tools to be really good parents because they were raised how, I mean, they were raising me and my brothers how they were raised. So when I say that, it's, it's interesting because I've talked to so many parents now who said, wow, I never thought about doing something different than what my parents did because that's all we know, right? So sometimes you have to step out of that comfort zone, learn something new, learn something different, try it on with curious exploration and see if it works. So that's kind of what I've done and one of the things that, uh, what I realized when I was telling you about the inside of the cup, my mom had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and we, she lived in Iowa. So I grew up in Iowa on a farm. She still lived on the farm. And here she is in 70, 71 years old, diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I said, mom, Let's enjoy the time that we have together. We don't know how long it is. So where do you wanna go? Where do you wanna travel? Let's get out and see the world. And she says, I wanna go to Northeast. And I was already like Northeast, yes, like Vermont, yay, New Hampshire, Maine. I've never been in that part of the world. Yes, let's go to there. And she says, Northeast Iowa. I was like, what? why? <laughs> why would you want to go there? And she's like, because I haven't been. And I said, don't you want to go somewhere else outside of the, the state? And she said, no. She couldn't even fathom what outside the state looked like. She was so inside of her cup that she didn't think, she didn't think to think there was anything bigger better, different, new opportunities. And so I'm gonna challenge you today to really think about where it is that you are right now and how you could step out of your comfort zone, meet new people, have a new conversation and see where it goes. So I started this journey and one thing led to another. I had a, an idea for a software uh, idea. And at the time, Startup Weekend, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Kansas City Startup Weekend, you go and you get 60 seconds on stage to pitch your idea. So I went, I have no idea what I'm doing and it was scary and yet I did it anyway. And my idea was picked out of 20, I was top eight. And I was like, awesome, I get to make this idea, this idea could become a reality by Sunday. This was a Friday night. And then you had to have people join your team. You kind of had to like sell yourself how to, to join your team. And I didn't do that. I just stood around and looked at people because I was literally terrified. And I had one person join my team and I said to her, I said, you know, I don't think this is going to work with just the two of us. I think we need to disband and go work on other teams. And during that weekend, I really saw myself just learning, just picking up knowledge, just picking up, like meeting all of these people that I had never met before, but also trying new things. And that was kind of my journey on stepping out of my comfort zone. About six months later, uh, some of the alumni 
from that group actually had a Facebook group and they said they were looking for extras to be in their commercial. And they were looking for females. And I was tagged by another friend of mine in the group. So I went, didn't know what to expect. And here we are on a football field in the middle of August at 8 a.m. And I don't know about most of you are from the Midwest, I'm assuming. And so, you know, eight o'clock in August is freaking hot. <laughs> right? And there we were sweating, shooting this commercial. And we had probably 15 takes. And I was like, wow, this is only a, a two minute thing. And yet we've been here for a couple of hours. And every single time where my portion came up, I was next to the guy who had the speaking part, except for once. And that's the one they used. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> so I spent all that time out there and then ended up getting you know, up on the edited floor. They, they, they cut it out. And so I, but I took that experience and I was really thinking about it and I was sharing it with the people around me in my, in my support system. And I'm like, man, that was really fun. That was really cool. And they said, well, wait a minute. Why weren't you the one with the speaking part? And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't think that's who I am. And they're like, are you kidding me? That's exactly who you are. And so I got to thinking about it later and I was like, well, why wasn't I the one with the speaking part? And I thought, well, I'm old now and only fear is stopping me. And I thought, wow, how crazy is that, that fear will stop us from doing something new, doing something different. It didn't stop me from getting there. It didn't stop me from getting there the six months before, but now it was stopping me. And I said, well, I have to fix this. So what could I do to be comfortable with speaking on stage. And I was, I was driving to work. It was like an aha moment hit me. And I thought, huh, I'll take an improv class. So I signed up for improv and I took that for a year. So much fun. And one of the things that improvs will teach you is to stop overthinking. Who here ever overthinks? I know I'm guilty. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And I, and, and really oh, people call it, well, I'm a really good analyzer. And now I say, that's such a cute word. <laughs> that's such a cute word to call it. Cause that's really not what it is. You can analyze something and then not making a choice or not making a decision from analyzing that's fear. If you analyze it and then take action, that's not fear. But when you just analyze it and it stops you, that's how fear shows up. So here I am on improv. I do it for a year. There's nothing else for me to do. And I went, okay, great. What's next? What's the next step out of my comfort zone? What am I going to do? And the thought came to my mind of, well, maybe I should take some sort of self-defense class. I love to travel. Sometimes I travel by myself. Maybe I need to do that. So wouldn't you know how sometimes you put things out to God, universe, whatever you want to call it, and they show up. On Facebook, one of my friends posted that she was have, attending a self-defense class for free in honor of uh, women who have been in abusive, um, in abusive situations. So I went and it was Krav Maga. Do any of you know what Krav Maga is? It's Israeli defense fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's a, it's a martial arts, <laughs> kind of along the lines of jujitsu, but yet you're standing, you're not wrestling on the ground. And so I went and I learned amazing things, scared to death, got beat up and beat up other people. And yet at the same time, it was almost like dance class to me. They teach you how to do the steps and then you go and repeat it. So I did that for a year. And then my body said, no, you're not doing this anymore. Your body's breaking down, it's hurting, you know, you can't keep this up. So I went, okay, what's next for me? What else do I do? And I had this amazing support system around me. And so I hope 
those of you who are listening, you really have a, a support system around you because it's so crucial. Support is so crucial. Positive support is crucial. We have people who are, you know, sometimes those negative Nellies, right? We like to call them, but the, the, the positive people. And so I had these positive support people around me and they said, you know, you've done so much, you could be a life coach. And I went, huh, a life coach? What does that look like? So wouldn't you know, I found a coach who helps you do your coaching business. And I said, okay, let's, let's go for it. So now we get to the point after working for about three or four months and he's like, Shay, I think you would be such a great coach. It's time to build your website. I just need you to clarify your message for your website. And I went, wait, what? Clarify my message? Isn't that why I paid you? <laughs> I mean, I've given you a lot of money. Now you want me to clarify my message? Uh, okay. And truth be told, I didn't even really know what kind of coach I wanted to be. I knew I wanted to be some sort of life slash business coach, but I didn't know what that looked like. Now, from my salon background, I thought, well, maybe I could coach other salon owners. So I went and talked to several of my friends who owned salons around the city. And I found out that when you are not willing to look at yourself as an issue, then you, they're probably not going to pay you any money to, co to coach them. And that goes with anybody, right? So if you're uh, not willing to say, I need to to work on this, I need the work, then nobody's going to uh, hire you as a coach, right? But you have to admit, I need some help. And some people aren't willing to do that. So just like it goes, right? You put it out into the universe, God, they answer. So I'm thinking, well, what, how can I clarify my message if I really don't know what I'm doing? And I started searching on Facebook events of all things. And sure enough, what popped up, a, a conference, a workshop in Nashville for clarifying your message for your website. And I was like, well, there it is. Here's the answer. So I went and it was amazing. Um, it's with StoryBrand with Donald Miller. If any of you know that name, um, they're great marketing tools. So I learned a lot. And the funny thing is, is that I met this woman there and she looked familiar to me, but I couldn't figure out why. Well, it turns out she is Rhonda Britton, the original life coach on the scene. She used to be on Oprah. She had her own TV show called Starting Over. And now she has started the, uh, founded the Fearless Living Institute and she certifies coaches I mean, who would have thought <laughs> that I had to go to Nashville to meet somebody that would help me really create my, help me create my um, coaching business. Now you're probably sitting there thinking now, again, why does all of this matter? It matters because had I not done the one thing out of my comfort zone to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, all these doors wouldn't have opened. So while I'm in Nashville and her and I are talking, she tells me that what she does as a fearless living coach is really help people step out of their comfort zone. And I said, what? I've been doing that for the last few years. I guess this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I traveled to LA just a few months later, take the first uh, workshop that she had offered, fearless conversations workshop. And within the first two hours, I felt like I was in a hug. I felt so supported, so um, genuinely educated. And the other thing that she, she shares that I think is just so interesting to me, and it's why I'm in the leadership role that I'm in now or the leadership coaching I'm in now, is that she said, there are coaches and then there are dirty coaches. And dirty coaches are really consultants. They're not coaching you. Consultants give you their opinion. Coach, uh, consultants give you advice. Coaches ask the right questions. And then they empower the person they're coaching 
to make their own decision. And that is when I went, wow, that's really key. And that's really what I want to do. I want to empower people. So that's kind of where I've been. And uh, then when I started coaching and about six months in, you know, my dad passes away. And right before then, right around that same time that I went to this workshop, he had told us the story about how he was drafted to Korea. Um, and I'm assuming the Vietnam War, but he never said. But he was drafted to Korea in the army. And as he's telling me this story, now mind you, this is the first time I've heard it. I had thought my whole life that he had enlisted. I had never heard that he had been uh, drafted. And so he's telling us this story and he's telling us his time, he had a year in Korea and he's telling us about that. And he said, you know, I just came back to uh, Iowa to be a farmer. I didn't have a choice. And when he said, I didn't have a choice, that like just got my soul. And I thought, huh, how many times have I said that? I know I was in that relationship saying it, going, I didn't have a choice to get out. I was just waiting for him to kill me. I know I've been in jobs where I'm thinking I don't have a choice to leave because I, I make so much money, I need to stay here. And I thought, how many other people have really thought that, that they didn't have a choice? So about six months um, after I started the coaching, I had two weeks with him and he passed away. And I didn't, we didn't even know that that was going to happen. He was in the hospital and, and next thing you know, he was gone. And looking back, I wish I had asked him more questions about his time in the military. But unfortunately, I didn't get to. However, I feel like he lives on in the work that I do. I had started a, decided to start a podcast. I mean, why not add more stress to my life, right? I'm grieving my father. I'm, I'm in a coaching business and I'm running my salon business. Why not add something else? So I started a podcast and I interview this gentleman out of Oklahoma City who, he's also been in Kansas City. So some of you might know him, Brian Paul. And he was a firefighter here in the Independence Grain Valley area, but also he was um, in the National um, Guard and participated in Oklahoma City bombing. In fact, that was his first um, Guard weekend. He had just signed up like two weeks prior. And while interviewing him for my podcast, he was telling me about how he had PTSD from both being a firefighter and um, being in the military. And after that interview, a couple of things happened. One, all of these veterans started to show up in my life. I kept meeting them over and over again. They, I, they came out of the woodwork, whether it was a Facebook request or somebody introducing me, connecting me, or maybe they were um, just reaching out to say, hey, I heard his, his um, interview and I really want to talk to you. I really want to be on your show or whatever it was. And then the next thing that happened is it got me to thinking about trauma. I had experienced trauma in my relationship. I had experienced trauma as a kid. And I thought, huh, how is it that as a, a society, we think of PTSD only for the military when actually most of us have experienced some sort of trauma. Well, remember, I'm a fearless living coach, right? So I really started to dive in and learn about trauma and fear. So you don't get to choose if something's happened to you that it's a trauma. Your brain decides if it's a trauma. And that's when the fear shows up. The trauma happened at one point in time. Fear is what shows up afterwards is just part of it. Fear wants to keep you safe. Fear's job is, be, to, is to make sure that you, you don't get hit by a bus when you step, out a curb, step off a curb, but it's also to protect you from 
emotional fears as well. Doesn't want you to, you know, maybe uh, be the first person to say that you love them or the first person to say that you are sorry. So fear's job is to protect us. So as I'm on this path of what is next, and now I have a podcast and I really think, okay, what's next with my podcast? I go to a podcast uh, conference in Orlando and I meet about, I don't know, three, 300 people because that's what podcasters do is they network, they connect and they collaborate. So on the fourth day, I meet one person whose conversation really stood out to me. He said um, that he was a city leader for Bunker Labs in San Francisco. And I said, I know what Bunker Labs is. I've been waiting for them to launch here for five years. And he's like, well, they're about to launch and I can introduce you to the, the city leader there. And I said, great. And then he said, well, tell me about what you do. And I said, well, in my coaching business, I now transform trauma into treasure. He said, wow, have you considered working with veterans? And I said, well, funny you should say that. <laughs> they keep showing up and I don't know what that means. So that's really funny that you say that. And after that conversation, I really started to think, continue to think about it. Now, in the beginning, remember I said, when I got that relationship, I thought about what is it that I don't know that I need to know in order to move forward? Yeah, that question kind of applies in all areas of life. So now here I am, don't know anything about really the military. I don't know anything about veterans. I'm not, I never really been around it because my dad never really talked about it. So I didn't really have that access. I had gone to him, gone to the VA a couple of times with him. So I had that experience, but I didn't know anything else. So I started to journal and I have been journaling for 20 years, but that was the, the question that I continue to journal because then I can look back and see. And so I'm journaling, what is it that I don't know about the military, about the veterans that I need to know? And within a matter of weeks, a friend of mine suggested or in, uh, inter, um, invited me to go to a, a networking event with the VFW and the Kansas City Business Journal. And so I go and on stage, all corporate America is talking about how to hire veterans. And one of the uh, corporate America guys there said, well, you have to give them a purpose when you hire them. And I thought, hmm, is that the issue? That you're giving them a purpose, you're not helping them find a purpose. And so I thought, well, if you're giving them a purpose, that's on your terms, right? That's on their terms, not the, not the, not the, the veterans terms, that's on the corporate America's terms. So then maybe they're triggered so then maybe depression kicks in and then addiction kicks in and then 27 now a day commit suicide. Hmm, maybe that's the path because in the military, they're given a purpose. They're taught to think, they're, they're, they're given everything, how to dress, what time to get up, what to eat, they're given things. So now it's time to really help them think for themselves in a way that they probably never thought before. What is it that they don't know that they need to know in order to move forward? And so after I had this, was sitting there, I was thinking, uh, I asked my friend that invited me, I said, so wait, so if they're helping them give, give them a purpose, is there anything in the transition period from military back to civilian life that helps them with a purpose, like help them find a purpose. And I thought, huh, that's a really good question. She says, that's a really good question. You need to talk to uh, so-and-so. So I go, and I won't mention names just in case he's on this panel. And so I said, okay, my name is Shay Sparks. I'm a certified fearless living coach. I have this idea. I'm just curious. What is the 
transition period look like? What does the transition programs look like in order to really help move military to civilian life with helping them find their purpose? And he says, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. I said, okay. So now I'm on a mission to have that conversation and see what see where it goes. Next thing you know, I'm in Washington, D.C. Because, oh, by the way, one of the things I've always wanted to do is live in two places. So when the opportunity came up, I jumped in. So I live part-time in Washington, D.C. So I'm at my place in Washington, D.C. And one of my friends said, you need to talk to Congresswoman so-and-so. And I said, oh, okay. So I make an appointment and I go to Capitol Hill and I have a meeting with her defense fellow. And it's so, and I'm laughing and you guys probably don't even know, realize this. I'm a small town girl from Iowa. And now here I am on Capitol Hill talking to a Congresswoman's defense fellow. That was huge for me. Remember how I said how fear used to stop me? Now here I am on Capitol Hill. And what I learned in that conversation is that they really lean on nonprofits to kind of help them take over, so to speak, after they're gone from the military. They do have a TAPS program that is a transitioning after program. And it depends on who, when, when you uh, retired or when you got out, could be a week, could be a day, could be a pat on the back and say, good luck out there. So after I left the Congresswoman's office, I thought, maybe it's me, maybe I have to do something about this. And before you know it, the Spark Your Alpha training program happened. And I say happened because I don't believe it was, I, I created it, I believe I co-created it. So I'm a spiritual person, I believe in God. And I feel like God woke me up in the middle of the night and said, Alpha. And the next morning I was like, okay, I don't know what that means, but I'm ready, you give it to me. And so I got on my journal and I just wrote down what Alpha means. And Alpha it stands for, it's an acronym and it stands for awareness, leadership, purpose, hope and alignment. And what it really is, is how leaders change their language around what leadership looks like. And I had the amazing honor to teach that course, teach that class to professional development educators in the Air Force just two weeks ago. And I'm just in awe <laughs> that because here I am taking all these steps, taking all these different things, and now here I'm teaching educators in the Air Force, something that I never would have expected, which leads me to here today. And Randy asked me to be on this. So if you take away anything from today, I hope you take away that when you step out of your comfort zone and just kind of go through uh, what that door of opportunity is with curious exploration, it takes you further than you could ever believe. That's awesome, Shay. I mean, that's, it's such an inspiring story and it's an opportunity for you to be an example to others who find themselves where you were 20 years ago. Yeah, Drew and I were having a conversation with somebody yesterday that has a chance to step into a leadership role and it was scary because it was new and it was different. <laughs> and that was the conversation we're having is those things are good when they're, when they're scary and different. You found some way to push yourself out of that gravity that was dragging you back. What was, how much of, of that, when you look back, was inside you already or was looking around at role models or was finding mentors? What helped you find the courage the first time to go do something scary? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think 
<laughs> so what I actually I was thinking about this this morning is uh, how many of you have been in a role where your your mentors, your leaders around you weren't great examples. That was me. Yeah, yeah. I did not have great examples. And so instead of thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to be like them when I, you know, I'm going to be like them when I grow up kind of a thing. I thought, okay, how can I be the opposite of them? What is it that they do that I don't want to do? I want to be completely different. And uh, that's really kind of what happened. I would just meet people, uh, whether it would be in my own uh, organization or at networking events, because I went to a lot of networking events just to, to meet people. And there was a different way of approaching how things, were, uh, how conversations. I didn't look at what it is that they were saying. I was looking at what it is that they weren't saying. So for me, I'm a invest in yourself, invest in people kind of person. Like how is it that business leaders are really investing in their team, investing in their company, investing in the people in the company? And uh, sometimes they're not, sometimes they are. Sometimes they have really great programs. They have really great team builders. They have really great connections. And a lot of times they're just, they're at the top and that's all that matters to them. The people that are underneath them don't seem to matter so much. And I thought, huh, so what if we change that kind of narrative or if maybe I'm able to change that narrative. And so that's kind of how it started, Randy, is such a great question is really looking at what is it that I wanna be? How can I step into what's different than what I already know? I think Drew's got a few observations, just, you know, that alignment between military and business and creating purpose. Drew, you want to build on that a little? Well, Shay, I, I appreciate your, your story. Um, uh, I tried to compete for a TED Talk on that very same subject that the military seemed to have cornered this market on post-traumatic stress, which is a, which is a cop-out because so many people experience uh, so much in their lives. Um, there had to, I'm going to ask the question a little bit different than what Randy said, because there's got to be, you know, with dealing with, when did you see yourself in the mirror and recognize that you had to, you had to change? I think that's part of my, was my struggle, was the direct self-recognition. Um, and there's always somebody out there that puts that mirror in your face, but I, I you know, it, you, you somehow manage it. I'm wondering if this is just something by nature, uh, um, built into a certain people and handling, handling resilience. Is there a resilience gene? Uh, I'd be curious if you think what you think of this resiliency gene, as opposed to uh, people who don't have that resiliency gene and somehow manage to spiral out of control and not be able to recover, regardless of somebody putting that mirror in your face. But is there a story or something that, that sort of ties that back for you? Yes, and it's kind of twofold. So I'll answer the first part of your question was, was there kind of, a, if I got it correctly, was there a defining moment where I was kind of a self mirror in the face of, holy crap, I got to do something here. Yeah. So for me, it was, uh, I had actually, so it was around that time, it was probably, gosh, I don't know, six, seven months later after that I got out of that relationship. And I was really trying to peel away the, the layers of who I am, right? And heal. And I went to go visit my brother and his new wife for Christmas. And they were, their relationship was just really, lack of a better word, bad. <laughs> they didn't really communicate very well. And it was almost as if they were just roommates and they had were just newly married like a few months before. And I came home and realized, huh, I am a, emotionally unavailable. My family was emotionally unavailable. That's the house I grew up in. Um, they didn't know how to express their feelings. They didn't know how to communicate to each other. 
They knew how to communicate about each other to someone else in the family. And normally that was me, but they didn't really know how to say, I love you. I'm sorry. You know, this is what I need. Nothing like that. And so as soon as I got home from that trip, I'll never forget. I opened the door, dropped my suitcase and literally laid on the floor of my apartment and thought, oh, I'm emotionally unavailable. Okay, got it. I'm emotionally unavailable and I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know what to do. And um, I just feel like God spoke to me in that moment and said, you have to be vulnerable. And I was like, what? I I don't even know how to pronounce that. I can't do that because that's that fear, right? Being vulnerable is scary. And so I thought, well, that's kind of what I have to be. I have to be vulnerable. I have to be willing to take a chance. I have to be willing to share my feelings, what I need, what it is that I, I want to do. And that's kind of where it really started, um, Drew. So thank you for asking that. It's the willingness to be vulnerable. Willingness to be practiced being vulnerable. And I think that's kind of all of my steps out of my comfort zone was just trying new things, putting myself in positions where I was vulnerable um, and, and talk and say, hey, I'm new here. You know, and I would do that on a regular basis. I'd be like, I'm new here. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and then the second thing, is there a resilience gene? I'm going to actually say no and say that we're not taught to acknowledge our own resiliency. I think we all have resiliency. We're just not taught how to acknowledge it because in society we've gone, we've said, oh, you have a big ego, you have a big head. Who do you think you are? You're arrogant, you're all that. When you acknowledge the things that you've gone through. And if you can just take a a, a moment And write down, again, this is where journaling is so important, write down what it is you've overcome. That's when you can acknowledge your own resiliency. So for anyone who has, you know, gone, maybe they were a bully growing up, right? Maybe they've been bullied. Maybe they were a bully. That was me. I was a bully and I was bullied. Maybe they've gone through addiction, but they've overcome that. Abuse. Maybe it was an argument that they quote unquote won because they apologized and let it go and forgave. That's resiliency. The opportunity to get up and continue to keep going is to really acknowledge all the things that you do. And I think as a society, we're not taught to do that. Does that answer your question, Drew? Yeah, it, it does. I, I, you know, I've, I've had so many more experiences with people going through some significant trauma because of combat. Um, but I, you said a couple of terms that were just spot on to me, and I appreciate that. The vulnerability uh, piece. Um, I find faith-based solutions are way better than medication. Uh, I think that's another thing the military got wrong which was throwing medicine at the symptoms and not solve the problem. Uh, And then, of course, you talk about purpose in such a powerful way. You have to find your own purpose. And I think that's where as business leaders uh, in Kansas City, I've seen it over the last seven years being here. uh, Leadership in this town creates purpose. That's what it's about. And if the leadership can create the purpose, individuals will will flock towards that purpose. So thank you so much, Shay. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else have to uh yeah, let's go to Steve for a question. That was me, Randy. Yes, you Steve. Sorry, a little slow to get to my unmute button. Well, Shay, I greatly enjoyed your story and love the way you combine the story with um, important elements, I, I think, of uh, growth. Um, it's a great way to convey uh, information, and you did a great job with it. You made mention of uh, the change in language uh, by leaders. I, I'd be interested in uh, having you expand on the 
What are the elements of that change in uh, language by leaders? Yeah, so one of the things is how many uh, leaders do you know they talk about expectations? They say, my team is expected to do X, Y, and Z, right? And an expectation is really an assumption. So you're assuming that that person completely understands what that goal is instead of an expectation, a goal of what you want them to do. So what I have uh, leaders do is really ask clarifying questions and allow their team to ask clarifying questions. Because even as a leader, we think that everyone knows what we're talking about, right? And the truth is that there's probably one per, at least one person that doesn't get it. And yet they're afraid, goes back to that fear component. They don't want to look stupid or incompetent or weak or like they're new or don't know what they're doing. So they're afraid to ask those clarifying questions. So the way to, to, to counteract that is to really create a space as a leader is to, you know, guess or um, you know, just kind of put out there of what kind of questions could, could, be, um, could be asked. So you ask the question for them and that gets that dialogue going with your team in order for them to be comfortable enough to ask questions. So that's kind of the shift in one of them is to shift the language from um, having expectations and is really assumptions to just being able to clarify. So rather than just give directions, be vulnerable and ask questions. Absolutely. And I will say the leaders that I have talked to, speaking on that vulnerability piece, the leaders that I have talked to, when you exercise, and I'm going to say exercise, even practice, we'll say practice, practice being vulnerable and saying, this is the direction we're going to go and I'm not sure it's going to be, uh, it's going to get us there. However, the process of us getting there and the things that we learn along the way, the learning opportunities along the way is going to make us better. Rather than saying, this is it, this is where we're going and I know for a fact this is gonna work, <laughs> right? And then, People are like, I can't believe he said that. I can't believe she said that. I mean, of course that that's not gonna work. But if you're willing to be vulnerable and practice being vulnerable, that's a muscle. So one, it builds confidence as a leader, but it also builds confidence in your team in you because you're willing to quote unquote, make mistakes. I don't call them mistakes. I don't call them failures. They're all learning opportunities. So when you're as a leader willing to create or be able to, to um, approach things not working out the way you wanted them to as a learning opportunity and being vulnerable with that, you're, you're just building respect and trust from your team. Well, that's great stuff. I, I, as I'm listening to you, uh, Shay, you know, back in the day when I was in getting my formal education, there were no classes on leadership. Right. And for business owners, no, there's no minimum education requirement to become a business owner or any continuous learning requirement to uh, stay in a leadership role. I'm kind of wondering for the younger people in this audience, Randy, um, any feedback on current day leadership in business schools or whatever? Uh, do they talk about vulnerability as a form of an important element in leadership? Uh, I'd be interested in hearing any feedback on that and I'll, I'll stop talking. I don't know. I don't know if anybody in here has exposure to that of how that's being taught in school now. That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure what your leadership classes in college would look like today. 
be interesting to know. Hey, uh, I can throw in something here. Kansas State has a really has an awesome uh, leadership program they've developed over the last several years, and uh, my daughter's actually in one of their classes right now. And uh, I'm they've done Strengths Finders, uh, they've done a couple other personality profiles, and you know I'm I'm kind of in this same this working with businesses for several years and and uh, in different leadership roles and. Uh, she always laughs about me reading uh, business books. What kind of boring business book am I reading now or something to that effect or leadership book or whatever. And I think she's finally getting the, she's seeing it as something fun. I think it's her favorite class she has this semester. So uh, I don't know what KU is doing in, in Missouri and some of the other regional schools, but K-State has a really uh, strong leadership program. Yeah, I know Jill, no, no. Jill knows a school that has a lot of leadership uh, classes. Uh, just ask her son. <laughs> Same school that Drew went to. They've uh, they've turned out a few. <laughs> I think they've got a track record there. You know, Shay, one of the things um, I've always felt like, you know, when you when you keep something inside you, it's a little bit nebulous, but as soon as you write it down, it gets a little more real. You've done a lot around journaling. Talk about that, of the power of just writing down, not necessarily to give it to anyone or show anyone. It, you know, Maybe there's different levels of formality, but just what that does for you to help you sort out your thoughts and give yourself a goal and stick to it. Yeah, so journaling is... Uh is an interesting subject because most people think that it's just writing their thoughts down on paper. Um, I worked with the Dean of Psychology at Avila University many years ago on mindfulness. And mindfulness is really just being consciously aware of what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And the, uh, the art, I'll call it the art of journaling really connects your brain down your arm to your hand to the pen and to the paper so and then it releases something so remember how uh, we talked about in the beginning of who overthinks you know sometimes just getting those thoughts out of your head allows you to get to open up space allows you to create a, an opportunity to get that out so then you can make that decision. Maybe you're thinking the same thing on a loop constantly, but you're not really seeing it as a, like a, a list. So by just by journaling it, you can go, okay, well, there's all my options. There's all my choices. So in the beginning, you know, we talked about, I didn't have a choice. Well, now you see that you have choices and you, maybe that's not even listed there and that sparks another idea to write down, but it's visually, it work, helps you because you're actually seeing it. You're seeing your own words, one, and you can kind of uh, make a decision from that standpoint. But two, think about where you were last year. <laughs> I mean, literally last year, this was the last like normal quote unquote week, right? Uh, of 2020 and think about all the things that you've been through in this last year. If you had kept a journal over your experiences over the last year, you would be able to go back and look at it and think, wow, I have grown. I can acknowledge my own resiliency here, <laughs> right? Because you go, wow, I had no idea. That's, that's what I was you know, going through. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was feeling. You know, maybe it was a, a difficult time with, you know, figuring out how school was going to work. And now your kids are so used to it. They're teaching you, you know, things on Zoom that you didn't know that it was, was possible. That's what journaling does. It, it gives you an opportunity to one, clear your mind and really get it out and create space for something new. But it also is an opportunity to go back and acknowledge your own resiliency of what you've come through. 
think Mike Kenny probably could talk a little bit about how important a part of this is of of your program of having people write a letter and get a lot of those things down on paper. One of my um, I think marriage therapy you know, is be asked exactly that, you know, what is it that makes journaling so impactful and effective? And the way she described it was that it's left brain, right brain. So there's conceptual and then there's concrete. And the act of taking a conceptual thought and then making it concrete on paper, having to coalesce those thoughts and then actually articulate them in writing that in, in uh, integrating those two, I'll say hemispheres, Mm-hmm. That that in itself is therapeutic, and then of course you know what Jay was saying: the the reflection piece and being mindful is always just as just as impactful. So yeah, journaling for us is a is a big thing as well. Linda, I think you were away a minute ago. We had a question just about how is um, you know how is leadership taught in the colleges today, and how much is vulnerability a part of teaching leadership. Yeah, sorry about that. I had to grab a call. Um, We do a lot through the executive MBA program, but we also now have advanced leadership certificate. And uh, being from Rockhurst University, we do a lot on self-reflection. And what I've learned this morning is that's where you actually come from as well, Shai. It is all about um, you know, facing yourself. So there's a lot that we do. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to catch up with you about it. I'm not recruiting for the executive MBA here. I'm just interested in helping people find what it is they're looking for that is helpful to them. However, if you're interested in the executive MBA, I won't say no, but um, this has really been extremely helpful. And I know for myself, as I went through your question earlier on learning from bad leaders, that really resonated with me. And that was one I had to journal with a lot. And I learned a lot through that. And I learned a lot about myself because it made it true. And I just couldn't pass it off or fluff it away anymore. So thank you. Um, Does that answer the question, Randy, on leadership? Anything else? Yeah, I think that uh, is really insightful. And I love how all this is tied together today about what we're talking about. It's awesome. And, this is and there awesome. are people all around us that need that nudge that they have some idea, mm-hmm. an entrepreneurial journey they could take or some new role they could take or some thing they could do. And they're afraid and they just stay stuck. And you, you mentioned several of them, Shay, well, I'm, I'm making too much money to make this change. And I'll ask people all the time, how much money is it worth to be miserable? If you're waking up every morning and you don't love what you're doing, how much money is that worth? You know? <laughs> Randy, that's a podcast. Yeah, that is a that's podcast. podcast. <laughs> I can tell you, I took a job for the money. Worst thing ever. Worst decision ever. But we, yeah. could, count, we could all name off tons of people we know who are handcuffed and trapped to jobs they don't wake up excited about because they're afraid of what making less money might look like. Yeah, I call myself the chief excitement officer because I am excited every single day and I help other people get excited about their life and their business. I always tell them you might have a short term bump, but if you're waking up every morning excited about what you're doing, you're going to far surpass wherever you're stuck. But it's hard to see that and it's hard, you know, so I applaud you for having the courage to push yourself into one uncomfortable situation after another to go to, to start this journey. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Randy. This has been awesome. And um, I would love, love anyone. If you want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my website is shaysparks.com and you, all my social media links and podcasts and stuff is on there, but yeah, I would love to connect. So thank you for having me, Randy. Awesome. Well, everyone have a great weekend. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks, Shay. Thank you.